Uh, good evening, all of you. This is the uh, a webinar on planning and implementation of uh, <coughs> digital repository using uh, DSpace. Myself, Shiva Broto Banerjee from uh, National Digital Library of India. I think uh, many of you have heard about this uh, project. This is uh, a project of uh, project under the aegis of uh, Ministry of Human Resources Development, Government of uh, India, which is peer headed by IIT Kharagpur and uh, currently host uh, currently being um, um, uh, currently being hosted from iit kharagpur uh, under two host names one is uh, www.ndl.gov.in and another is <coughs> ndl.iitkgp.ac.in so here uh, today uh, you know um, uh, we are uh, feeling i was thinking of uh, um, means sharing some uh, uh, videos or sharing some uh, information with you in this uh, lockdown uh, of the uh, due to COVID-19 disease. And uh, um, uh, I, uh, thanks to Bengal Library of Association, thanks to uh, Mr. Uh, Dr. Joydeep Chando and uh, Mr. Sujan Shaha for hosting this one and uh, inviting me for this uh, talk. <coughs> so this is a start. <coughs> so uh, here today topics will be covered is mainly what is a digital repository. Many of uh, I have many queries actually you might know that uh, uh, I have conducted around 25 shops throughout the country and uh, I have uh, met around I have trained around 1900 odd librarians throughout the country. <coughs> they may be some uh, system admin there may be some uh, 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 students, uh, those who have participated in our uh, workshops throughout the country. Uh, uh, I have found a lot of misconception uh, which has been uh, come up. Uh, uh, this misconceptions, uh, uh, I, I just wanted to uh, uh, clear those misconceptions that uh, what is the digital, that is why I started from started to speak that uh, what, what is a digital repository and uh, what are the concepts, what are the terminologies, uh, those, uh, uh, those are to be un uh, understood by the librarians so that they can uh, um, actually uh, come up with uh, solutions themselves. So today there are four topics I uh, will be covering, what is a digital repository, what are the features of a digital repository, how to plan, how to set up a digital repository, what are the planning. Um, 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 uh, topics or the planning points you should uh, uh, remember while setting up a digital repository and uh, uh, how do you implement it with DSpace. I think you might know that I have, I have, uh, I have generally uh, taught about uh, DSpace, I have, I have been in those hands-on sessions and uh, this is a collective experience of all the hands-on sessions uh, uh, which uh, NDL, uh, uh, which I have uh, done with NDL. Uh, so, this is the first slide of me. So, what is a digital repository? So, this is a mechanism for managing and storing digital content. This is a very uh, real, uh, thing which you can say this uh, managing a digital repository is something um, um, means uh, you need to understand what are the things to be managed and uh, you know you need to understand what are the digital contents, what actually are the digital contents you are going to store. So, coming to the digital contents, there are, uh, I have just classified, there may be some other uh, um, uh, what called type of digital contents you may think about, but here I have classified into five parts. One is ebooks, one is thesis, dissertations, articles, journals, proceedings, etc. So, these are a separate class of uh, uh, digital content which generally we find in uh, institutional digital repository or maybe a uh, a conference where the conference is being held on, held it, held so they generally put up the proceedings and uh, uh, articles uh, journals and all these things and here uh, the other uh, part of uh, other digital contents like uh, there can be music there can be a song there can be a, a music of a, 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 a maestro uh, who has sung, uh, uh, instrumental music uh, there may be a part of a music there may be a, a part of a um, uh, 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 maybe a tabla which has been played. So, this is uh, uh, what we called a music. Uh, speeches, there may be a lot of speeches by uh, 
uh, very uh, legendary people. Uh, and uh, I also say that uh, these are actually they fall under a prop uh, a called a link uh, uh, proper uh, what called uh, a category called audio uh, books or maybe audio files which I say will be more of this thing. There can be sound of animals etc. So here uh, also there are uh, some uh, the third is video lectures. These are mostly uh, concerned with the video files, video lectures, movies, clips, animations etc. So, these are the separate, uh, these are is the third category of uh, digital contents which we were talking about. Another is manuscripts. <coughs> manuscripts, as you understand, manuscripts is a physical thing, but a digitized copy of a manuscripts which I would have been written, it is a digitized copy of manuscripts. These are, um, uh, can be a digital content because manuscripts obviously has, we all know that manuscripts uh, have a very, uh, um, uh, what called, um, very important for the researchers, those uh, doing research on um, um, uh, uh, history or maybe a history of a place or maybe a language or whatever it is, but manuscripts are very much important in that case. And the uh, five fifth part is the images or photographs or drawings, all these things. These are a separate category. Why I have uh, made this uh, kind of uh, thing? Because I thought that this uh, kind of uh, uh, thing is actually uh, divided uh, according to the type of metadata or the type of uh, learning resource type which we say if I talk talk a bit technically I say a learning resource type this is a learning resource type maybe a ebook maybe a dissertation maybe a articles maybe audio um, uh, clips they may be a video clips maybe manuscripts maybe images or photographs things. so uh, these are the kind of uh, um, um, digital contents which we are uh, generally concerned of we just we need to manage or we need to store this kind of a digital content in a digital repository and to the left you will find some questions which generally come to your mind uh, this is uh, uh, what is an institutional digital repository so institutional digital repository if you ask me the institutional digital repository is mainly uh, hosted by an institute so institutional a digital repository can be of many kinds one is an institutional digital repository one can be a uh, dig digital repository which is hosted <coughs> uh, by or maybe hosted by an individual say individual maybe an organization is also hosted uh, hosting a digital repository maybe a NGO is hosting a digital repository they are not called institutional digital repository but because once we talk once we say that it is an institutional digital repository we generally think that we will find things um, publications uh, related to research work over there. So, these are the digital contents which are uh, uh, placed in the institutional digital repository. <coughs> now, there are uh, for digital contents bit a uh, bit of uh, more if you go in a way of a digital content, uh, this is the type of digital contents which we were we were speaking in the last slide. Now, this slide uh, says that what are the locally ho hosted digital contents. So, let us see what are lo locally hosted digital contents. So, uh, these two persons are they want to share contents from their hard disk. They have the content in their uh, repository or maybe in a hard disk, maybe in a NAS uh, which we say network at a storage or whatever it is the content is digital content is with them. Digital content is with them. They are placed in their uh, local storage. So, this is the uh, with this we locally hosted digital content. <coughs> what is next? A person want to share videos from YouTube. Say you have a YouTube channel and host your uh, videos from there. You have something, you have uh, made a film huh, and you want, have uh, hosted in Vimeo. I think many of you have heard about Vimeo. Those who are working with uh, movies and films, they know ve uh, Vimeo very well. This is a very good site which uh, keep all the uh, movies in a very uh, what called uh, high resolution videos over there. So, this is uh, now you want to share those contents from YouTube and Vimeo. So, you do not have the content in your uh, local disk, you have it in a YouTube. So, can you share those contents? If a person wants to share YouTube videos, yeah, he or she have a channel. So, can he share, can he or she share it? <coughs> the third part is, I have a good collection of very old and rare documents. Say, um, you will find lot of collectors they collect lot of documents from uh, very old like uh, earlier in my early days I remember I used to store I used to uh, collect stamps 
I used to collect the, uh, the upper part of a matchbox. I think many of you have done this in your early days. So, uh, this kind of uh, rare documents, what at that time, very somebody wants to collect old coins, somebody is collecting old newspapers. So, they have their own type of collection. Maybe it is digitized, maybe it is not digitized, that is a different. But here in this kind of this thing, I am mainly speaking of digital coins. So, maybe you have collected something, but you have digitized it somewhere. So, can he or she contribute? So, how do they contribute their contents? They have digitized those contents. So, now, <coughs> uh, uh, these people, those who are having their contents locally hosted, up, uh, put it up. They will just upload the content. They will create the digital repository and upload the contents in their digital repository. There is no hassle in it. You know very well, you know, there are a lot of uh, digital repository softwares around available and they can easily put up their contents and they can uh, 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 share it uh, with the public. Now, the person who wants to share the YouTube videos or maybe a YouTube videos or maybe something which is remotely hosted, it's not with him, with them. Now, they can provide the URL to the contents. They can provide, they will not store the contents directly, but they will provide the URL to the contents. So, those URL will help the people to uh, see. Actually, people, uh, a, a person visiting your site <coughs> will uh, come across the link to that particular URL. Now, that particular URL will be helping you in uh, showing the, uh, showing, helping the uh, user in showing the contents. Now, if it, this kind of uh, thing happens for the third type, I have a good collection of old rare documents and uh, uh, say some kind of document, say uh, 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 something which you cannot take a picture of, say something you cannot digitize you have a newspaper, you have a newspaper and it is brittle, you know, old books which are uh, stored in very uh, dusty places and all this thing. So, you can, you can just take a photograph of that book. You can take, uh, you cannot scan that uh, newspaper. You can just take a photograph of that book, put it up. Uh, uh, th th this we called the surrogate of that book. Maybe, uh, maybe a newspaper, maybe a news, uh, um, uh, what called, uh, uh, it may be a, a video file which you have somehow recorded from somewhere else, say the, uh, uh, the uh, speech by uh, 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 the first prime minister of India. Uh, so, time it was very important and somehow that person have recorded that speech. So, it is with him. So, he or she could uh, put it up there, but a person a, 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 there, he cannot uh, um, digitize that statue. A, he is not allowed to take picture of that. So, he can put a maybe a smaller version of that picture, maybe a low resolution picture of that statue and put it up in this document and with proper metadata. But here all we say, so you know I think uh, I am speaking, uh, I, I am in this live session with uh, most of the librarians and I am not, uh, um, uh, I am not allowed to say what is a metadata over here because uh, metadata is understood by each and every one. But in a single line, if you want to say for those who are not librarians, because I have been told that there are many people over in this session that they are not librarians. So, in this session uh, uh, for them, I say metadata is a data about the data, means information about the data. So, what you have content and you about the content. It is not exactly the content, but some information about the content which makes you understand the content in a better way. <coughs> Now, what is stored in a digital repository? So, first is metadata as you as you all know that uh, metadata is stored in a digital repository. What is second? Uh, this second is uh, contents and full texts. So, in this full text, uh, uh, contents and full text. So, in this way, uh, um, I would say that uh, uh, the files which are uh, the files which you upload, they are contents and the extracted version of the text, extracted uh, version, uh, extracted text from those contents are called full text. So, these two are saved in the contents. Now, the third thing which is coming here is the index. So, this is the third part which is stored here. So, the uh, index, I think 
Now, many of you already know what is an index. So, in this se in this session, uh, uh, I would just say index is a, 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 a collection. Uh, uh, index uh, will help you to understand uh, uh, what is uh, what. Uh, how do you store? How do you search or retrieve the contents in a better way? <coughs> okay. So, in on the left side. I have asked that what is an index, why index is a separate entity and uh, is it not stored with the database. So, many of you have, uh, many of you know that it is not, uh, it is uh, generally uh, stored with the database. As you see that uh, in a database, I, we index the database so that it is searched easily. So, uh, but um, uh, here the index is saved outside of the database. So, this is called an inverted index. And here the index obviously is a separate entity. Here the index is a separate entity, right? Now comes the contents, how they are classified. So in this digital repository, this is a feature of a digital repository, it can classify contents. In the initially I have said that there are various types of contents. Uh, there are thesis, clips, video clips. Uh, what called uh, manuscripts and all lot many things. So, this kind of a classification is required. So, in this way you uh, in this uh, digital repository you uh, need to understand that each and every contents needs to be stored in a, a separate category or separate classified bucket. I have shown you in buckets here that all the digital all the contents in a digital repository are stored in a different buckets. <coughs> Okay. Now, uh, this So, in this way uh, I would say that in this uh, uh, digital repository the third feature which I am talking about is the uh, manual and batch processing of uh, data or steps to review data entry. Uh, uh, so, is it uh, do you know what is the data entry? Data entry you know that all you all of you know that there are a uh, lot of things in a uh, lot of things are to be done in, in data entry. So, in this kind of a uh, data entry. Uh, you just uh, 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 type in the metadata and you upload the contents. So, this is what we call the data entry. Next step is the accept and review. This is a reviewer who is accepting the content or rejecting the content. So, if a, if a data entry is going on, and, uh, it is directly not archived uh, because why it is not archived? Maybe uh, a reviewer, uh, uh, sorry, a uh, 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 data has made some mistake which will be uh, uh, checked or reviewed by the reviewer who will either accept or reject the uh, uh, what called uh, uh, your content or metadata, whatever it is. It is if he, he feels that it is accepted, put it up or he can. Uh, reject the content and again the rejected content will come back to the data entry operator and then the data entry operator will again correct and reviewer once again. So, next uh, last step is archive. So, this is the last step. So, before a uh, uh, data entry operator archives the data. So, here is a process of review, reviewer accept and reject. So, in this step, uh, 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 so this is a feature of a digital repository. This feature is a very important feature in digital repository. So, it must be there so that a data entry operator di directly uh, is not allowed to archive a document. So, here uh, I would say that there are uh, two kinds of uh, um, data entry. One is uh, manual uh, on the to the left hand side. You see that uh, there are manual data entry and a batch processing. Uh, so, manual data entry and uh, you know the difference between a manual data entry and a batch processing. So, manual data entry is uh, you type in something and you uh, uh, mm, uh, what called uh, uh, mm, uh, upload the content, but in a batch processing what you do is you uh, mm, 
make the uh, metadata and the content ready in one go, uh, sorry, uh, maybe in a lot of iteration, and then you ingest or upload the data in one go. So it is a batch, it, it, is, a, it is forming of a batch. So it, 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 it works in batches. So it, it uh, uploads uh, a batch of documents at one go. Uh, now, if I ask you if the second question, if you see which is the better way of data ingestion, so just can you think of which is the better way of ingestion and just come up with your solutions to me, uh, uh, maybe uh, somehow by mail or maybe uh, uh, questions or whatever it is, just come up with me that what which is the better way of data ingestion. Uh, in uh, I will uh, I, I will talk to you uh, there which is the better way of ingestion at that time. Now. <coughs> Now, after I have uploaded the contents, so now what? Now, users are allowed to access the data. Now, users need to get access to the credential document. So, this is also a very important feature of a digital repository, which I would say. So, uh, the digital repository must uh, uh, see that who the access to the data and who are not given access to the data. So, the uh, or maybe uh, somebody is given access to some extent not beyond that. So, uh, in this way say a server is there, somebody is restricted access and somebody is open access. So, this is the way we just uh, 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 differentiate the kind of a data. So, this is a very important feature of a digital repository. So, digital repository must have this kind of a feature so that it allows the user to access the data maybe it may be an open access maybe it is a restricted access so restricted what is the difference between an open access and a restricted access because a digital repository generally allows you open access so if you are uh, accessing any content so the digital repository will say that okay uh, 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 you are given access but say may there may be some contents maybe uh, you have made a digital repository of say all the office orders of a particular office. Now, in this kind of a repository, if you say that all are allowed to see all the data, so it will be quite difficult for a manager to manage that if all everyone sees what is the office order of a particular manager getting transferred to somewhere else. So, these are some confidential documents uh, 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 needs to be have uh, needs to be given a restricted access say in in if, so this kind of a thing say in maybe uh, in case of a uh, uh, phd thesis also uh, say uh, somebody has submitted his phd or thesis or maybe a dissertation so now he or she has to publish a paper uh, maybe he is uh, communicating with the uh, publisher and uh, he is going to publish a journal shortly and it is under review now he says that you put it up put up my data i have given you you put it up in your repository but it must not my thesis must not be viewed by somebody else right so if you say that so in this case it is restricted you need to put a restriction on that but is it possible that you put a restriction on uh, uh, student have or the research scholar have asked you to uh, put a restriction on this kind of uh, uh, thesis for maybe six months or maybe one year. So after one year, you need to remember that you need to take it take a note of it that after one year you need to release this one. After you have to set a date, uh, you need to set a date where you need to say that after this. I need to go back to my repository and release this one and put a res, uh, put uh, uh, or remove the restriction over that particular thesis. So, in this kind of a scenario, you must put a restriction. Now, how do you manage that? How do you manage that? There are in um, several uh, repository softwares, open source softwares, every most of the repository softwares has this kind of a facility. In D space, this is called embargo. I think many of you have heard about embargo. So, this is called embargo. Uh, so, you have a put a restriction on that and that restriction can be removed after some time. <coughs> now, the question comes of a implementation of a digital repository using a content management system. So, you know what is a content management system? Content management system is the contents which you are putting up in a repository. Those contents are required to be managed along with the metadata. So, each and every metadata 
is pointed to a particular content. So, they need to have a link between the metadata and the content. So, this is called a content. This all these things is done by a content management system. It does a lot of things, but it is a part of that content management system which does all these things. Uh, so, now the first step in implementation of a digital repository. So, till now what we have learned is what is a digital repository, what are the features of a digital repository. Now, we will learn how to implement, what are the points we need to remember before we plan for of a digital repository. So, on the left side you will see that lot of uh, uh, icons are given where uh, this uh, uh, a um, uh, lot of uh, open source uh, uh, digital repository softwares are there, uh, maybe DSpace, Islandora, one is uh, um, uh, OJS collective access. So, these are very uh, green stones. So, all these are very common known, commonly uh, used uh, digital repository softwares. But to implement each of these, you need to first plan yourself, plan a implementation process. So, this will help you first select a free and open source tool depending upon the type of your collection. So, you can work with a, uh, you can, you can uh, ask a company to design a digital repository software with for you, but I would suggest that you are, uh, uh, you are, you can de uh, uh, configure a open source tool uh, to maintain a digital repository uh, in your or institute or maybe in your organization. So, first, first step is in that you do not go for uh, directly for uh, um, uh, if your uh, policy or this thing does not, does not uh, uh, allows you then it is fine. Otherwise, you must go for an open source tool for your learning for your learning right. Now, what are the things uh, what are the type of collections you are planning for say maybe you are only having thesis uh, you are uh, developing a institutional repos digital repository. So, you are only uh, uh, you are only having thesis uh, you are a publisher or you are a kind of uh, integrator. So, you are uh, um, uh, making a digital repository of journals articles proceedings all these things uh, you are a collector you are putting up manuscripts. Uh, they have a separate kind of they can be put it up in a separate kind of uh, digital repository. Uh, you have multimedia files you are a, a, a musician or you are a uh, what called you are a composer. So, you develop lot of composed music or you just uh, compile lot of musics right you are a DJ. So, you uh, come up with lot of musics. So, in this is kind of a multimedia repository you are planning of uh, you can put up uh, some geographical data in this. So, what are the geographical data? A location of a particular place, a climate of a particular place, having latitude and so this kind of uh, data having its own resource, having its own set of metadata to represent this kind of say you have a map, you cannot directly put up this map and say that who is the author of that map. Nobody knows who is the author of a geographical data, who is the, who is the author of a uh, multimedia file, they can be composer, they can be singer but they cannot be an author for a song hmm. or maybe there cannot be author for a music. So, this kind of a thing is, uh, is different from a thesis. The thesis have an author, a journal has an author, uh, um, articles, proceedings all, all have an author, but manuscripts they may have an author, they may not have an author, but multimedia files like audio clips and all these things may not have an author, the geographical data does not have an author. Uh, so, and so, you need to, so what I, my aim is to uh, uh, make you understand that uh, depending upon your type of collection, the open source tool needs to be selected. You can go for DSpace, you can go for Islandora, Omeka, uh, Greenstone, Collective Access, Open Access, so the OJS, so whatever it is, but you need to think that these are the collections which I have myself. I should make use of this tool. So, go for learn or go to the net, go to the internet ask uh, Google sir that uh, what kind of a tool has what kind of a, 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 a metadata map to it or what, what are the uh, pros and cons for this kind of a tool. So, you understand that you have a this kind of collection. So, what which tool is uh, will be uh, correct for you. Now, uh, classify your contents after you have selected this thing next is that you classify there will be a separate uh, uh, classification techniques. So, it may be that uh, um, a broad subject area is classified, 
uh, in a thesis. Say maybe uh, in a thesis you say computer science is the broad uh, subject area. Next is uh, image processing, uh, uh, artificial intelligence, machine learning, information retrieval. So, these are the subclasses. Then you put up like uh, uh, um, in machine learning uh, years in 2010, these are the thesis which has come under uh, machine learning. So, these are the thesis which has come under image processing. So, these are the thesis in, in this year come under uh, uh, what called uh, artificial intelligence. So, in this way it goes away. So, now uh, also you can put it share, uh, you can classify it according to the date place and time of the photographs. So, you have lot of photographs which has been clicked, you have collected lot of photographs from uh, or you have clicked lot of photographs in your lifetime, you have visited lot of places. So, the date uh, of the of taking of the photograph that is most important because today you take a photograph of a particular place, next you find that that, uh, uh, that has been changed. Uh, so, this is uh, uh, um, this is quite uh, 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 difficult to understand that whether this place was uh, this date and this place was actually there or not right and the time of the photograph. So, it was taken maybe you are attending a, a big uh, uh, talk uh, of a of a particular person and in this time uh, it, it was taken at that particular time. So, these are the areas these are the uh, classification which you can uh, which uh, uh, you will be able to classify your content. Now, uh, next is the metadata standards, you need to fix the metadata standards. So, which metadata standard you are working with? Maybe you can working with Dublin Core, you can work with Midas, you, uh, you have lot of uh, options of metadata standards. Um, so, you can select according to your collection. So, what is that? Uh, so, in this metadata, in these kind of metadata standards, you can describe your data in a better way. You can describe your data in a better way. And now to access the contents, how to access the contents. So, on the left hand side, the question comes how to access the contents? How do you access? Is metadata accessible? I, you have those questions in your mind. Uh, you have just think of the, whether metadata is accessible or the content is only accessible. Uh, now, where do we upload this content and metadata? Where do we upload? <coughs> now, we are now ready to start ready to start where we are going to upload this content. <coughs> now, uh, your after you have selected all these things, now install the CMS software. Maybe it is DSpace, maybe it is Omeka, maybe it is Island Dora, whatever it is, you install the CMS software. And now you configure, you started start configuring the software, how the software uh, uh, maybe it is working under uh, uh, is in, in its uh, workstation, it is installed in your uh, college or an institute, it is installed in your company, wherever it is. But you need to, you start the installation and configure the CMS software. You create logins, uh, logins who will be the data entry operators, who will be the reviewers, all these things you need to create the logins and design the data entry forms for them. They may be uh, the lot of uh, people, those who does not know about how the in data entry forms are designed. So, they uh, 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 need to uh, know that what are all the metadata uh, fields they are going to enter and their data entry forms are to be given. Now, you start uploading the contents. Now, so the four steps are first is install the software, configure it, create the logins, now design a data entry form for them and start uploading contents. <coughs> now, the required infrastructure. Now, this is a very important point. Lo I have uh, I have been asked a lot many times that what is the required, where will we install? Uh, do we need a server to install? We need a, somebody has ordered a big server where they are putting up their digital repository and they have only 500 contents. So, it is uh, it is uh, quite difficult uh, for me to make them understand that you do not need a server of such a high capacity server to in host your digital repository. It can be your laptop, it can be your desktop, but some uh, obviously there are some uh, configuration uh, things which are required. So, first is that <coughs> you need a CPU, CPU any CPU with the latest Xeon i5 or whatever it is, RAM I would say, I would suggest that if it is an institutional repository, generally all these things depend on the file size, depending on the file size, maybe the fi uh, file size means which file size, the uh, file size of the contents which you are going to upload, the file size of uh, all like uh, 
uh, maybe the contents means uh, the file size of uh, the files which you upload into the uh, repository. Mm, maybe uh, if your file size is uh, bigger, it is very big file size, maybe a file of uh, a few hundred MBs, maybe it is a 500 MB file. So, you need a more of a RAM to uh, show it on your um, uh, for the uh, uh, what called um, uh, um, what called uh, show it to the uh, uh, users. Uh, you have uh, uh, you need to have uh, that much of hard disks also to host your contents. See, the you need to think that your contents uh, needs to be hosted there. So maybe you have a collection of a repository. Maybe it is a, a collection of some files which is around uh, say. Uh, uh, the files will be combining around uh, say 400 GB, uh, it is in a 1 TB hard disk, so it is a 400 GB size of your total repository. So, you need to plan for a 1 TB hard disk in that case, because your repository, uh, this also will grow, like uh, today it is 400 GB, tomorrow it may be uh, going to 500 GB, 600 GB and so on so forth. So, in at least you need to plan for that much of space so that in next maybe 2 3 years you need not uh, go for a hard disk upgrade so upgrading anything is quite difficult so better for this kind of resources finalize at the first moment ram upgradation is also difficult hard disk upgradation is also difficult for uh, or maybe uh, cpu you need to change the complete set of hardware you need to change the desktop or change the server if you are upgrading the hardware resources Network for network, I would say it is a 1 GB LAN is sufficient for that and you need to have, uh, if you are hosting it outside, uh, if you are hosting it for public or you are hosting it for in a public domain, you need to have a WAN connection, you, uh, maybe uh, through an ISP, uh, maybe it is NKN, maybe it is some other private service provider, whatever it is, you need to have a WAN connection and uh, uh, this is the part of the hardware resource gone. So, now for the software resources, I would suggest that please use Linux to host your mostly uh, the open source digital repositories. Because you know Linux, there are lot many instances, lot many options that you can host your digital repository in Windows. But I would suggest that using an enterprise Linux is much uh, better to maintain because in National Digital Library of India, we maintain lot of servers and you know all these servers run 24 into 7 without a, with a 99%, 99.9% uptime. So, I have seen that it is, it runs very good on enterprise class OS. So, if it is a Red Hat, if it is a CentOS, these are all enterprise class operating system. So, these are, uh, this can be, uh, this is okay. Uh, there are some questions uh, which are coming up in the YouTube, uh, my YouTube uh, this thing uh, live that uh, uh, someone wants to ask some questions. So, it is better that you ask your questions in YouTube. I will answer all those questions or you can just put up your questions or mail me in, in, in the slide. Uh, in the first um, uh, slide, I have my mail address, my phone number uh, uh, that is in WhatsApp also. Uh, so, please mail me, I would prefer if you mail me uh, your questions so that I can answer you in a better way, right? Uh, mm, uh, mm, uh, because answering in a YouTube live is quite difficult, uh, it, 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 it is live, but it is not live in that way, it is not a video conferencing kind of thing, thing so uh, I will not be able to answer all your questions over here now, right? Now comes, uh, uh, now the after the operating system is gone. So, here I have written Ubuntu, uh, CentOS, Fedora, Red Hat, all these are the uh, uh, flavors of Linux. These are the most popular versions of Linux. Then there are many, many, many Linux which are available in the net, which generally uh, is uh, related to this kind of a thing, which is based on Fedora, which is based on Debian, which is based on Ubuntu or which is based on CentOS. So, um, um, uh, you can install in those, those Linux. Uh, but what we would suggest that if you are going for a permanent uh, thing or if you are trying at your home, you can do it in anywhere, you can do it in Ubuntu, Fedora, Red Hat, Windows, whatever it is. But uh, if you are going for a, uh, your institutional repository or a repository for your company or a repository for your uh, organization, so better you go for Red Hat or CentOS. Red Hat is a uh, commercial version and CentOS is a uh, uh, free version of uh, is an open source free version of uh, Linux 
operating system. Uh, so the second thing which is required is a D space uh, like free operating system, uh, free uh, open source software. Uh, sorry, uh, in this uh, um, um, along with DSpace, there are a lot many free operating system, uh, free open source uh, softwares available for uh, designing a digital repository, and uh, each of these have their own prerequisites. Uh, say like DSpace have some prerequisites, Islandora have some prerequisites, your collection access, collective access have some prerequisites. So these are different kind of an op uh, open source tool which have their own prerequisites. And uh, for database, again uh, Postgres SQL, uh, Postgres SQL is used. Postgres SQL is again an open source RDBMS tool. Why Postgres SQL is used? Yes, Postgres SQL is as powerful as Oracle. It can handle, you know, you know, today, today, uh, in, uh, National Digital Library of India has around a very close to 5 crore contents and all these contents I would say it is hosted in a single PostgreSQL instance. So this is the power of PostgreSQL. So it is a very good powerful database which is <coughs> uh, uh, which is which works as a metadata store for a DSpace. And the last part, last uh, point which is a little bit of confidence I think uh, I can give you the confidence that all of you uh, who are uh, uh, trying to install DSpace, uh, uh, trying to uh, make friends like uh, you know um, uh, before you make your friends you need to friend spend some time with them. So just spend time with DSpace so you get a friend to DSpace and DSpace will tell you that where actually you are making mistakes. So just like a good friend it will guide you that in this way you go by this way so that you can the place where the DSpace is installed and it is fully functional with all the functionalities. <coughs> now uh, uh, this is the link uh, of National Digital Library project uh, uh, website where we have hosted our uh, institutional digital repository uh, software idr.iso where you will where you can download uh, it from right. Now this is the online documentation of DSpace 6. Here I will be generally talking about DSpace 6 and uh, uh, mm, so just go to these sites and uh, try to read those contents. What is the why DSpace, why it is so popular, uh, how can it be installed, so all these things are there. Yeah, installation steps you will be uh, feel that uh, after reading those installation steps uh, you know you will feel that no it is not possible for any non-technical person to install. but just have patience let me go to the other slides you will see how this is uh, very easy to install. Now the prominent features of DSpace is it is free and open source software this is all of us know and second point is store and preserve wide range of digital objects with metadata it can store and preserve wide range of digital objects wide range of digital objects right, ranging from uh, image uh, photographs uh, videos audios uh, up to uh, 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 what called your uh, flash files, your uh, flash uh, contents. Uh, it can store. It can store up to lot many things. Lot many things. If you go to the, um, uh, 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 if you install DSpace, I will show you in my uh, later uh, uh, webinars that where from you can find what are the digital objects which can, which it DSpace can store. So the third point is that submission workflow, it has a proper submission workflow. I have shown you earlier that what is the submission workflow? You have a data entry, you have an accept reject step and then the content is archived. This, so this is the uh, submission workflow for data entry. <coughs> now it has also facility for batch ingestion. So what is a batch ingestion? Batch ingestion is, I have said you earlier that you inst in ingest, it is ingest means you uh, upload contents into DSpace in a batch, in a batch means in a in a group batch means in a group like uh, I think many of you have worked with windows they have batch files so batch files is a collection of uh, uh, some commands running in one go so this is something like that batch ingestion so it has a good search and retrieval system search and retrieval system you can search in dspace and retrieve the relevant content of yours so you can find that yeah, I have got what I have searched, what I have uh, searched is the thing which I have got it, right. So this is, this search and retrieval system backbone of this is Lucene which is developed at Massachusetts Institute of Technology, US. So mm, they have uh, developed this Lucene, this is very, very, very powerful software which is used in most of the 
uh, search and retrieval system we call it an information retrieval engine IR engine we call it now dspace is easy to deploy use and maintain so deploy is thing where we are need to uh, deploy uh, 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 we can make you uh, understand that why it is so easy to deploy use and maintain also I uh, will show you in the later slides that how it is how to easily deploy a dspace how easily it is used to uh, uh, it can be used and maintained so and lastly dspace have a good community support i think many of you know what is a community support like if you are if you are facing any problem you can ask in a community like initially uh, i have installed dspace 1.0 in probably in the year maybe 2006 or 2007 i just forgot maybe in 2005 or 6 i have installed dspace so so they in that time i did not get a community support i need to find each and every problem which dspace used to have uh, which i used to face all those problems and i need to get it solved uh, by making my uh, uh, my technical know how into the work but now it has a good community support because it is used by lot of developers lot of uh, people throughout the country now the last is last but not the least is easy backup and restore this is the most important thing in uh, a digital repository if if you are not able to take easy backup or you are not able to restore your contents very easily you will not be using a software because if something happens to your repository uh, this uh, backup of your repository will help you again build up the same repository with least effort <coughs> now the kind of user interfaces it has one is a JSP UI we call it Java server pages user interface you know Java server pages very well JSP is a very common term which is uh, which is uh, 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 which you have heard lot of uh, in lot many places you have heard of Java you have heard of Java servlets you have heard of lot of things so this Java is used to develop a user interface in dspace the other interface which is uh, also similarly popular to jsp is xml ui it is called extended markup language user interface why you know html very well the extended of html is an xml so this xml interface uses uh, 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 xml uh, tools to uh, design the user interface so it is not that that JSP UI has a different set of features than XML UI both are having the same features but it is the ease of the user it is the ease of a particular developer to design or change or modify the uh, front ends uh, modify uh, various things within dspace as it is op uh, open source uh, so you can uh, play with the softwares uh, and uh, you can uh, take help of uh, uh, what called um, that uh, those technologies which are uh, in JSP UI and XML UI to modify the interfaces <coughs> there are three more interfaces in dspace one is rest rest it is not that it is resting over there no it is not that REST rest API it is uh, application programming interface this rest API of dspace it needs to be configured uh, separately after dspace gets installed and in through this rest api you can uh, query you can see what are all the contents what are all the communities what are the collections in dspace it is there and uh, you can do lot many things in rest api as you have can do in the front end there are big differences but rest api is a, a, a programming a, a, a api application programming interface say you don't want you de may not like the interface of a dspace and you think that i need to design my own interface of dspace and the query i will send to dspace and get the results dspace is already there so in that case rest api is very important to you uh, to host your uh, uh, to design a front end of yours solar is another endpoint solar is actually the heart of dspace solar actually is the stores all the index and it is uh, in between lucene which i have uh, told you earlier the lucene and the dspace so solar is between lucene and dspace so solar acts as a bridge between the contents which are coming from dspace and which are going to index in lucene this is very important index this uh, solar 
actually can be uh, 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 configured so that it can be accessed from outside but the solar is generally accessed only from the local host not from outside say a d space can be hosted outside but don't think that solar can also get access from outside no it not happens if you want that access that i want to see solar from outside then you need to configure your d space according to that or modify the port <coughs> third part of a third interface i think many of you know what is harvesting so this oipmh is a uh, third uh, interface of DSpace, which is used for har harvesting purpose. I will show you in my later uh, lectures that uh, how OIPMH is you being used. So, what are the installation prerequisites of DSpace? So, now in this prerequisites, first is Java as a programming language. Uh, you can go to the URLs which is being mentioned and see that what is Java and what what is uh, what. Apache Ant, which is used to compile the Java code. Maybe you are having a lot of Java code and they need uh, to be compiled separately, but you have 10 Java code. Why do you go to, and you need to go to each and every code and compile and uh, uh, come out. But Apache Ant will help you uh, to compile all the codes at a time and make you a, uh, give you a uh, archive kind of thing, which you can access. Uh, Maven also does the same thing, but Maven has a bit some more features than Apache and which also can pull libraries from outside if you are using some libraries which are not present in your uh, Java code. Now, PostgreSQL is the backend database which I have told you. Yeah, DSpace source folder is required. DSpace has two kinds of folder. One is the DSpace source folder, another is a DSpace installation folder. So, this source folder needs to be there present and you need to download this source from the internet. Now, the last is the Linux operating system, which you are uh, familiar with. Uh, so, in this Linux operating system, you know that uh, you need to install all these things. So, these are the prerequisites Linux operating system, Java, Ant, Maven, Postgres, and the DSpace source folder. But all these things needs a, a very uh, technically strong people to understand all these things and uh, 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 do it. Now, uh, in this, uh, we have uh, come up with some scripts. So, why these scripts? Because we have seen that if I ask you that go to the Java site, come up, come down and put this installation, say maybe give a big command like uh, uh, rpm minus ivh, then Java is installed. So, where is Java installed? You do not know the default path. You need to look for where is Java is installed. Now, you go for end. So, it takes lot of time, lot of time to install each and every uh, uh, software and each and every prerequisite before you go to install DSpace. So, what we have done? We have come up with some scripts. So, what are these scripts? These scripts are all these commands giving uh, put uh, at uh, maybe uh, say in some sequence. So, that if you run that script, all these commands get executed at one go. So, that you need to know that you this this is the sequence of there may be four to five scripts which you run run but if you are installing no, you if you are not installing with the scripts there are 10 to 12 steps to install dspace but in national digital library of india from national digital library of india if you download our idr.iso it will be installed in very less number of steps we have the tutorial with it if you down, if if you have got the URL, you can download it. See what are the tutorials you extract it and find out uh, uh, what all the tutorials are there. It will be very easy for you to understand. Now, if you download this file from this, open the ISO file, extract the idea tar dot gz. This there will be an uh, idea dot tar dot gz. This is a uh, archive file. Uh, uh, download uh, extract this archive file to your home folder and. Uh, if you are extracting that again unarchiving that idea dot r dot gz then you will come up with a idr capital i capital d capital r folder where you will be able to uh, uh, get the all the contents ready now <coughs> this idr folder must be placed in your home directory so before that i would like to say that in in linux you create a d space account in that d space account you are uh, you will be able to uh, uh, you will be downloading this idr iso and then you will be installing the 
uh, uh, you will be extracting the folder uh, idea dot uh, tar dot gz and this uh, uh, idea dot tar dot gz will also getting um, uh, put in this idea folder in in your d space home directory here home folder means your d space home folder here in this idea folder we have separate scripts for 32 bit and 64 bit operating systems you know what is a 32 bit and 64 bit operating system <coughs> now now these what are those scripts the, f the these are the name of those scripts copy 32 dot uh, sh copy 64 dot sh which are uh, used to copy the uh, files to relevant folders you don't need not bother you just um, give dot slash copy 32 dot sh or dot slash copy 64 dot sh that's all i will show you in my later slides which how this works now, uh, if you want to install PostgreSQL, don't go to PostgreSQL run. This is not that needs to be made executable. That is not running. This is not happening. No, it will not uh, go in that way. It will just simply just give PostgreSQL 64. It will come like in a uh, you have installed uh, a Microsoft Office. So you just next, 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 next. It get, gets installed. Now to test, see whether you have what you have done is correct or not. That is there to run that test.sh command before you run the installations command. So these are the few sets of uh, what called uh, scripts which are there, uh, which will be uh, uh, which is there in our in my later uh, talks. I will show you some more uh, scripts are also there, so which will be uh, presented. Now the first step is you install Postgres. Postgres is the database which you are installing. So now open the terminal window, run the following commands. I am in the home directory. If you open up a terminal, you will open the home directory. You will see a dollar symbol is there. Uh, I will later on, if you have some questions regarding, keep on asking questions in my mail and uh, maybe in YouTube uh, channel, uh, so I can answer, right? And uh, mm, uh, so give a command cd space idr, then you go inside idr directory and you run sudo then a space dot slash post pgsql64.sh or dot slash pgsql32.sh and so in this way I you, you can uh, 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 in start installation of the postgres now uh, while while you give sudo it will ask you for the password of d space user d space user which you are next 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 you just give as you installed a lot of softwares earlier so you give next next when it asks for a password then you give d space 1 2 3 two times d space 1 2 3 d s p a c e 1 2 3 don't give d and then a space bar don't use space bar d s p a c e 1 2 3 two times you need to give password two times so how to type a password i have some golden rules with me uh, in my later slides it will i'll show you so now comes the pg admin now once while this is installed the you run pg admin 3 which is the uh, interface of a postgres uh, server there you will see that postgresql server is there uh, um, uh, go to that postgresql server name it will be say postgresql 9.5 9.4 something it will be written so you click on that uh, come to uh, give wh while it is uh, while you double click over there you will ask you a password so give the password d space 1 2 3 which you have uh, given while you have uh, installed the postgres so there you will find on the left hand side there will be three windows on the left hand side there will be a bigger window on the right hand side there will be a, 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 a longer window to the left hand side on the right hand side there will be a uh, what called uh, uh, a horizontal window uh, on the left side you will see there are login roles or databases all these things are there so here click on uh, login role right click over login role and say create new role and give the role name as d space right in the next tab you will see that there if you click on the next tab where you are typing in the as a d space login on the next tab you will see that uh, um, it is asking for the password again you give the password two times it is d space one two three again i am saying there is a uh, way to type the password once you are creating a login id i will call, come to that uh, now once this login role is created you will see that below login role there will be only postgres written but below that or above that d space will come go to the top uh, just bit above that you will see databases again right click over databases you will see that create new database so first login role and then database so come to the database right click over that say create new database and again 
it will ask you that uh, what is the name of database it will given give d space d s p s e just below to that you will see owner owner you will see a owner written so on the right side you will see a drop down box so there a drop down menu will come if you click on that down headed arrow if you click on that you will see there are two users ones that you have created d space and the one user which is which was already there that's called the postgres so here you will select d space as a owner now after that database is created again click on the right click over the d space database right click over the d space database now say that uh, d space database right click over that and say you will find a new object if you click on the right click over the d space database you will see that a new object has come up there in that new object say new extension new object and then new extension in this new extension again a window will come up where you need to again a drop down menu will come where you will click on that drop down menu scroll down scroll down scroll down scroll down you will see pg crypto pg cry pto pg crypto is written so in this pg you need to select this pg crypto then you select okay that is the installation and configuration of your postgres is completed <coughs> now the next step is the installation of d space now with these there are uh, four steps to the installation of d space first is that you for if it is a 32 bit os you go the for the above part of my code uh, slide and if it is a 64 bit os you see the lower part of my slide here you will see that all the commands which are to be given each and every command needs to be given with a dot slash except the source command which is a internal command of linux so that source command doesn't is not prefixed with a dot slash so mind it type each and every command very 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 meticulously so that it doesn't give an error right last once you are done with all those commands give a dot slash test dot sh and see that whether your command there will be given you an output that all these things have been configured if this output is not coming java not found all these things not found so you don't go for installation so first rectify that then go for installation this is a, a test in between right now <coughs> if you are in this slide uh, if you are using uh, 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 a proxy server from your uh, institute then you need to conf uh, um, go to this dot m2 folder and dot uh, m2 folder is in your home directory where you will be uh, seeing a file called settings.xml where you need to delete the uh, portion from proxies to proxies there will be and this is an xml file settings.xml is an xml file so while you open that file there will be several tags in that there will be there will be finding a, a, a tag called proxies and it ends with the proxies so this part you need to delete if you are not using proxy server if you are using a proxy server then you need to give the ip address of that proxy server it is given there some different ip address is given here there and with a, a different port number you need to put your proxy server according to that uh, you need to configure or you need to type in your proxy server uh, according to the um, uh, 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 according to the proxy server which is used by your institute your proxy server and port right now this is this is your uh, 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 what called configuration and uh, prerequisites of dspace is over now the dspace starts installation so in this part you need to give dot slash install dot sh once you fire the rocket so here you need to uh, give this command and wait uh, till create administrator comes create administrator is the it will give you build success build success all these things if you have done all your process correctly up to this uh, up to this time uh, then you will obviously you will get a build success and a create administrator so once this is got you need to create administrator for uh, you, it will ask you for a email address it will ask you for a password you just give any email address any password just remember what password you have given that will be the administrator of your d space 
So now this create administrator will after this create administrator is done then it will uh, say that tomcat started. So tomcat is the horse upon which the dspace rides. If tomcat is stopped dspace is also stopped. So dspace cannot ride it by himself. So tomcat is the horse upon which the dspace rides. So once you say tomcat started now open your browser whichever browser you are going to firefox chrome whatever it is. Uh, 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 sorry, uh, Chrome doesn't come in Linux, it, it is Chromium, uh, uh, sorry for this mistake. In Chromium, if you have installed Chromium in Linux, it, it is as good as Chrome in Windows. So there you need to type in this URL, http colon slash slash localhost colon 8080 slash xml ui. So this is your interface of dspace, so this you will get. This is the interface of dspace, it is a xml interface of dspace uh, which, uh, which I will be showing you is mostly the xml interface of dspace. Uh, this is very easy to handle and easy to configure whatever it is, but we are going to showing you xml interface of dspace, right. So this interface will come. Now <coughs> these are the golden rules. Now in this kind of a uh, most important steps. So these are just golden rules that have that have, uh, 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 that is why I have given written in golden, right? So uh, the most important step in learning a software is to follow the steps and note the same before you try hands-on, before you go for a hands-on, before you go for a uh, installation in your or before you type in the keyboard. So before that, follow the steps. What are the steps? And note it down so that if you are missing someone, missing something, so you can tally it from the screen to your notebook. So that is the most important thing. Next is while login ID and password, I was just saying you a few slides before that use only single index finger to type the password, single index finger to type the password. Do not use your four fingers because four, four, eight fingers because if you type in this way, so you may make a mistake. You may make a mistake. So this, this is the way you create a new password. So somebody, this is for, this is not for all that those who are very much conversant with the keyboard going, uh, this is not for them, but those who are not conversant with the keyboard. So please use a single index finger, finger to type the password because I have said that on 30 workshops. So every each and every workshop we find at least 10% to 20% of the people making mistakes with while typing in password. They are, they are very much conversant with the keyboard, but they make mistakes because they were not typing. They do not know that which uh, finger has gone where because while typing in the password or while entering the password, passwords are not seen in Linux. So that is the most important thing. So this is why, uh, why we say that use only single index finger to type the password. Now do not close because do not close any window unless instructed means if you are closing any window, it will. Uh, uh, say all the paths everything are set over there so that will get disturbed. So in this way please do not close any window mm, uh, it will be a uh, unity launcher is uh, these are, we are actually in for uh, 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 for in, in Ubuntu we say it is a unity launcher it is minimized to the unity launcher. So that is why we uh, always say that do not close a window <coughs> and after last but not the least golden point is after entering a command in a terminal the output will come in the terminal. So please look at the terminal what output it has given. So please follow the output to understand what the system is going to tell you. This is the these are the very important four golden rules which you need to follow while installing this kind of a software, right? So uh, I think uh, last uh, part is this Tomcat uh, shutdown and startup commands are written. So sh dot slash shutdown dot sh and dot slash startup dot sh. I show you some uh, places where Tomcat is required to.